Hey you all, Farmer Jesse here. Today we are going to talk about the basics of composting. I know that when I started researching compost for the first time, uh, I was immediately overwhelmed with all the jargon and all the different styles. So this video will attempt to be the opposite of that. Something simple that basically anyone can do. The approach I'll demonstrate, in fact, for you today will be applicable regardless of your scale or goals because composting largely follows the same rules, whether it's turned with a giant tractor or by hand or by shovel, because I don't know who would just turn a compost pile with their hands. It seems like it would be a hot job. So I'll go through the different things to think about, some different styles, some different types of compost making, uh, the bare essentials, and more dad jokes. So let's do it. First things first, if you're not subscribed to this channel, make sure to hit the subscribe button. And if you are subscribed, you're awesome. If you appreciate these videos, uh, you can always support our work by picking up a copy of the Living Soil Handbook or a hat or other merch at notillgrowers.com or become a patron at patreon.com slash notillgrowers. Hit the super thanks button if the video is helpful. Um, YouTube videos are very rarely ever covering the cost of their production, so we super duper appreciate it, and I do not use the word duper lightly or ever in any other context. I'm not even sure it's a word. All right, so basic goal of any compost is to add nutrients, uh, beneficial microbes, and some lively organic matter to a garden, and there are so many types of compost systems out there that you can explore. And I'll talk about some of those at the end, but for me, in my opinion, the ideal way to start your composting journey is with what I'm going to show you today. I wanna to give you a tried and true, entry level, practically anyone can do it sort of method that has worked for us for many years and requires basically no materials and not a lot of experience. Um, now, the method does require some physical labor, so if you have mobility issues, I offer some less intensive methods towards the end of this video, though many of the same principles will still apply, so kick back and hang out for a few minutes. Generally speaking, the method all detail here is a great entry into compost making that will help you develop your nose, your eyes, your tongue, don't look at me like that, your senses for making good compost so that if you want to venture out and try some other more nuanced methods like Korean natural farming or some of those other things, you'll kind of have a base understanding. Okay, so let's start with tools. Uh, tool wise, you don't need much. All you will really need is a shovel and maybe a pitchfork uh, I kind of like having both because a shovel is not always easy to poke into a pile when it's first getting started because there's just like too much raw stuff blocking the shovel. Um, I find that a pitchfork is really good for turning it in the beginning and then a shovel for kind of the cleanup around the pile and then as the pile decomposes. Um, you may also want a tarp for covering or a covered area, but you may still want a tarp as well even if you're doing it in a covered area. And of course, like a hose for watering, a decent water source. We'll talk about that in a minute. A long thermometer is a nice addition, but you can also use a small household thermometer and just dig a hole deep enough into the pile to get the probe into roughly the center. Um, and that's basically it on the tool side. There's not a lot needed. Like I said, we're keeping this thing super simple. Next, we'll need to just do some basic trigonometry. Kidding. Fun fact about being a dad actually is that when you have your firstborn, you actually get sort of a systems update and it comes with like a bunch of really bad dad jokes and a dad bod and a U2 album. They're all strangely hard to delete. Now, before we talk materials, we should talk about location, like as in where are you gonna put your compost pile? Um, compost piles need to be in a location that drains. What I mean is that you don't really want to build a compost pile in an area where water is going to just sit underneath it, making the sort of bottom of the pile and the sides of the pile really anaerobic, um, and thus potentially incubating some disease-causing organisms. Um, if you don't have a choice but to locate the pile in a wet area, build up a thick layer of wood chips on the bottom and just try to avoid that layer when you're shoveling the compost out later. Uh, you could also build like drain tiles or something too, but let's just keep it simple for now. Also, if you do have a covered area, um, like a unused shed or something, that's nice for keeping excessive heat, like sunshine, and also excessive rain off of the pile. You want to be able to control the moisture, especially, in other words, uh, which I will discuss presently. Uh, it may likewise also be a nice neighborly gesture to locate your pile somewhere where a little smell won't bother anyone because although yes, a good compost pile should not smell, 
when you turn your pile for the first time, or probably the first three times, it will likely smell like something. Um, more on smell mitigation, more on smell mitigation. That's a great band name. More on smell mitigation in a minute. Uh, I also like to have enough space where I can pile my materials on one side and move them either back and forth as I turn the pile or move that whole pile in a sort of square fashion. Um, having space to actually turn the whole pile over is ideal. Like you want to be able to turn that whole pile from the middle out, all of it, all the way over. So you need the space to do that. Also try to avoid weedy areas for your composting pile, uh, or at least put down some like landscape fabric or something to block the weeds from contaminating, that is to say, seeding your lovely compost pile. Um, now, let's talk inputs or ingredients or feedstocks or materials, uh, whatever you want to call them. So you will need some carbonaceous, meaning ingredients that are mostly just like carbon, uh, which I'll explain presently. And you need some nitrogenous or just nitrogen containing materials uh, to make a good compost. But don't get too hung up on that jargon. Like don't let that cloud what I'm talking about. I'll explain. Generally, when I'm referring to carbonaceous materials, even though yes, technically every living thing contains carbon. Um, these are your brown materials like wood chips, uh, leaves, plus things like straw, preferably a little of each of these. Uh, a diversity of ingredients will generally make a better compost. But anyway, uh, the browner stuff. You can use hay too, but it uh, can be a little bit more complicated because of the weed seeds. So I rec recommend starting with those others. But that is all brown carbonaceous material. That's what we're generally referring to when we say your carbon or your brown stock. Now for nitrogen or the nitrogenous materials, uh, this is what is sometimes called the green part of the compost as opposed to the brown. Uh, these nitrogen rich materials are generally somewhat fresh, wet, uh, sometimes dark in color, sometimes colorful. Uh, so fresh cut grass is a good one. Rotting vegetables is often one that we use. Uh, basically anything from an animal, and I hope my vegan and vegetarian friends will forgive me here, but uh, that would be things like manure, viscera, feathers, feather meal, uh, fish scraps, etc. A little animal fat is okay, though a lot can take a while to decompose, so I just maybe just balance that a little bit. Um, just remember that anything that is high protein is also high nitrogen. You do not need animal products, though, to make a good compost. Indeed, for us, I would say most of the composts I make do not use a lot of animal products at all, relying instead on things like green waste from garden and kitchen scrap. Of course, sometimes we will mix in a little bit of fish hydrolysate as well, which is just a fermented fish liquid. That is a super unappetizing phrase. To add a little bit of nitrogen uh, if need be, but honestly, it's not that uncommon for us to have zero animal products at all in our composts. Uh, again, I like a diversity of materials for the best compost possible, but sometimes we just use what we have. Just like in cooking, good technique will get you further than the best ingredients. Ratios can be a little complicated, but let's try to make that part easy. Uh, usually people will tell you something like a ratio of 30 parts carbon materials to one part nitrogen materials is ideal, and it is, but that does not mean 30 buckets full of your brown source for every one bucket of your nitrogen source. Um, because again, all organic matter contains some amount of carbon. So the simpler approach here is to not overthink it. Instead of thinking about 30 to one, think more in terms of just covering your material, covering the rotting nitrogen materials up with brown dry materials. So in your composting area, you start by staging, what we call staging, uh, your materials in layers. Like for every five gallon bucket of kitchen scraps or whatever, add one or two or three buckets of carbon material, just enough to cover it depending on what you're using. And you will know it's adequately covered when you can't smell it. If it's straw you're using, which can be a little bit harder, just add about two or three inches or enough to cover the material fully. Um, and again, block the smell, and that should be enough. A little bit of, so for every bucket or so of nitrogen you put down, just cover it enough with carbon that you can't smell or can't see it. One clarifying note here, if it's a wet nitrogenous material like food scraps, you will need more carbonaceous material than if it's a drier one like grass clippings or material from the garden, which is not as wet and won't need as much carbonaceous cover.
that's as easy of an indication as any, is not being able to smell or see it. Uh, does that mean you're going to get a perfect ratio every time? No, maybe not. But it should be pretty close, and you can always just adjust as you go. Um, if it starts to smell, for instance, add a bit more carbon. And when you get into the heating and turning process, uh, you can always add a little more nitrogen if the pile is not heating up, for instance. Um, think of it like a soup and you're just adding a little bit of this and a little dash of that, uh, balancing it as you go with waste material. It's not the most appetizing analogy. Once you've got a pile that is three to four feet tall, or 90 to 122 centimeters, uh, that's when you can start the active process of composting. Um, it can be taller than that, uh, it could be a little bit smaller, it can be long, um, but the bigger you make it, the more labor it's gonna take. So uh, depending on who's turning it and how they're turning it, those are things to keep, just keep in mind so you don't overdo it. So you don't build a giant pile and then have to hand turn that multiple times. And the pile can be shorter, but much shorter than say like three or even three and a half feet can be hard to maintain the temperatures, depending on how warm or cold it is outside. Um, and just one quick note about that, about time of year. I compost all year long here in Kentucky, Zone 6B, famous for the world's largest bus stop. Is that true? But it can be a slower process in the winter and it can also be hard to get a pile going that is heated up. Um, so ideally, I like to start my piles in the summer and fall and then let them mature over the winter for the spring usage. But that, you know, sometimes you just gotta make compost when you have the materials. But compost microbes are incredibly resilient. So you can technically make compost pretty much wherever and whenever uh, with some limitations. All right, back to the pile itself. If your pile gets hot just as is, like after you've staged it, um, that is that is to say like above 131 degrees Fahrenheit or 55 degrees Celsius, you can go ahead and give it a turn. Now. I'm not going to go into the organic regulations around composting in this video because I did that here. So if you are certified, you do have to take good notes and follow NOP guidelines. Uh, if you are not certified, the regulations will not help you make a better compost. They are more or less just food safety regulations. They are not about microbes or soil health or anything, unfortunately. But the reason we turn compost piles is to mix the ingredients to add air, which aids in the decomposition process. We do it to break up any anaerobic pockets uh, to ensure even decomposition. We also turn to evaluate moisture. And as a bonus, in general, you kind of just get to observe the progress of the pile through physically turning it over. So I like to turn the pile once, check to make sure there is enough moisture to squeeze a drop of liquid out of it and add water if necessary. Moisture is wildly important to this process, to all microbial processes, but especially compost. Too much, like if it's mushy in your hands, or too little, like it feels dry and crumbly, um, and you won't get the desired progress or desired organisms, and you may even struggle to get the pile to actually heat up. And if you're adding water, Try to avoid unfiltered city water for the chlorine and chloramine, which are antimicrobial and, well, not great for composting microbes. After I turn the pile fully all the way through the middle, I cover it with a semi-breathable tarp, like not just straight sheets of plastic. Um, you can use just about anything for this that won't blow away or add weed seeds. It just needs to allow the pile to breathe a little bit while also managing some of the moisture because the moisture will try its darndest to escape in the heat. Um, from the heat from the pile. Now, it is the next day that I start watching the temperature really closely. I have this long thermometer, but you really just need to take a few readings in the middle of the pile to make sure the pile is getting above that 131 degrees or 55 degrees Celsius mark. If it is not heating up, you will want to add some nitrogen and just check to make sure there's the right amount of moisture. Now, if it's getting too hot, like above 165 or so, you will want to flatten the pile just a bit. Uh, you maybe also could consider a little bit of moisture to cool it down. Um, some piles you make will never need any real attention beyond turning them a few times. Um, others, you will have to baby along. Uh, it's just the way it works. Now, if the pile is warm but not hot, then you may want to pile it. I could use a better verb there. You may want to 
pile it a little bit taller as opposed to flattening it out and add a little more nitrogen of some form. Um, something that often works well to kickstart a pile is to soak fresh grass clippings overnight in non-chlorinated water, um, rainwater being ideal, and then maybe even a little bit sprinkle some compost in there. Um, and then pack that into the center of the pile and give it a day or two. Any wet green vegetation packed together should work. I mean, anybody that's ever mowed a lawn and taken fresh grass clippings out of their bag has felt how hot they can get really quickly. That can be a great way to just get a pile going. Um, now, again, because I'm certified, I have certain regulations on my piles. I have to turn my piles five times in the first 15 days while maintaining a temperature between 131 and 170 degrees Fahrenheit or between 55 and 77 Celsius to ensure it meets NOP regulations. But generally speaking with compost, the idea with the temperatures is to kill weed seeds and diseases. But if you are not certified and your farm does not fall under FSMA, Food Safety Modernization Act regulations, just turn the pile a couple times or a few times over the course of the next week. Um, it will make a solid compost that way. You will see the temperatures stay pretty high for a while um, and then they will calm down. It will likely still run hotter, the pile, than ambient temperature for a while. Um, and that's good. That's fine. That's the maturation process and will often build up uh, nice beneficial fungal populations during that time. Um, now, how soon can you use it? Ideally, you wait a few months to let it mature. But once it reaches ambient temperatures um, after hot stages, it should be mostly fine to use. It should smell rich and nice um, and not raw like manure or anything like that. And yes, you will absolutely be able to tell the difference. Um, you can sift it if you want, like you can build like a hardware cloth screen if you want. But generally, if you allow enough time for the compost to mature, the larger wood chips and such will decompose adequately enough that you don't have to. Uh, now, clearly this type of compost pile is very labor intensive. So ask someone for help if need be and please don't hurt yourself to do composting like this. Uh, if you've got access to a tractor and a front end loader, follow this same process, but with long uh, windrows instead of piles. You can always scale up to a compost turner if you're a bigger farm. Um, if it's beyond your capabilities, don't worry. There are other composting sort of options for you to explore. So let's just cover those briefly. Um, one technique that is allowed in organic certification is static aerated piles, which do not require turning, but require an aeration system. I did a whole video on this on ours last year that you can watch here. Basically, it's a set it and forget it type of system, uh, which is nice, though I suspect that compost is not always as good. I usually use the static aerated compost as our mulching compost, as I described in the Living Soil Handbook. Um, there are also things like the Johnson Sioux Bioreactor, which I don't personally have experience with, but there is plenty of info out there on that. On a small scale, a worm bin can be beneficial, but you do have to regulate what you add and the amount of moisture, and they honestly are not going to be able to handle all of your food scraps most of the time, depending on how much food scrap you produce. I prefer personally using the worm bins to enhance finished compost. You could supplement worms, which I love dearly, to be clear, I love my worms, uh, with something like maybe the Bokashi system, which is uses an anaerobic approach to decompose food waste with like lactic acid bacteria. It's like food scrap pickles, another appetizing image there. I'm sure someone will ask me about that electronic tabletop thing that supposedly composts your food waste overnight. I have no idea about that device. I've, I've never trialed it. Um, it's kind of a cool idea because managing composts in a house is a really obnoxious process sometimes, but I'm going to doubt it makes actually like a really high quality compost. I imagine that it just rather breaks the material up and breaks it down a little bit, which is fine, I suppose. Um, but some combo of Bokashi and worm bins and maybe a static aerated system could greatly reduce the physical labor involved in compost making for you and also provide you with some good nutrients for your garden. I also mentioned in a recent video that I will use chickens to help scratch a pile down or add their manure. Um, so you can check that out here. Anyway, let me know your thoughts and questions. Let me know how you make your own compost. Otherwise, like this video if you like this video. Subscribe to the channel if you've not already. Join us at patreon.com slash no-till growers and become a patron. 
pick up a copy of the Living Soil Handbook, where I dedicate a whole chapter to using compost and the four different types of compost and all of those things. You can always super thanks the fire out of this video. That helps too. All right, we'll see you later. Thanks for watching. Bye. Yeah, I duper like making compost. Make that a thing. I